Dr. Farina, uh, for being here and giving his time this evening, being willing to visit Rice University for this debate. Uh, now, the moderator for tonight's debate will be Professor Wayne Guida. He is a professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of South Florida in Tampa and a collaborating member in the Molecular Medicine Program at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute at the University of South Florida. Professor Guida has also served as president and CEO of Schrodinger Incorporated. He was the executive director of chemical technologies at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, formerly known as Siba Geigy Pharmaceuticals. There, he supervised a group of scientists engaged in molecular modeling, protein X-ray crystallography, protein NMR spectroscopy, protein biochemistry, high throughput screening, analytical chemistry, and organic synthesis scale-up. Professor Guida's current research interest involves the design of STING modulators, that stands for Stimulator of Interferon Genes, for the treatment of cancer, autoimmune disease, and anti-infectives. Please join me in welcoming the moderator, Professor Wayne Guida. Thank you very much, and thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I'm glad that Dr. Tour asked me to uh, do this. Uh, we have uh, an amazingly uh, 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 good audience here. We, I think every, just about every seat is filled. Um, so first, uh, let's just start off by welcoming to the stage Dr. Uh, James Tour and Mr. Dave Farina. Okay, so all of, uh, both of you make sure you're at your neutral corners. Uh, to my left uh, corner of the ring, uh, weighing in at, no, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not, not going to do that. Uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Dave Farina. He's a scientific communicator who hosts the YouTube channel, Professor Dave Explains. To my left is none other than Dr. James Tour. Uh, who is the TT and WF Chow Professor of Chemistry right here at Rice University. Okay, give me a moment, if you will, to describe the ground rules. So um, the way this is going to work is Dr. Tour will have the first 10 minutes to make an opening statement. Then um, uh, Mr. Farina will have another 10 minutes to make an opening statement. After that, Dr. Tour will take two minutes to ask a question of Mr. Farina. Mr. Farina will have five minutes to answer that uh, question. And a dialogue is permitted during the answering of the question. Uh, after that, Mr. Farina will have two minutes to ask Dr. Tour a question, and Dr. Tour five minutes to reply. And this will go back and forth like that till 8.30. We will make sure Alex and I, that they stick to the time. <laughs> uh, but my role is beyond just that of a passive uh, uh, moderator. I mentioned the timekeeping. But in addition, if, I'm, if I hear during uh, the debate something that, in my opinion, is not correct chemically, I will render my opinion. Uh, but I'll wait. I won't interrupt either of the debaters. I'll wait until there's a pause. Uh, then uh, what will happen at... Um, 8.30 is we will end that part of the debate and we'll go into a question and answer session where members of the audience can ask, qu ask questions and I'll explain exactly how that works when we get to the 8.30 time point. So once again, let's welcome the two debaters. Thank you. Before we get started, I want to do something. I've got a gift for Mr. Farina. Now, I was thinking, what, what could I get such an amazing person? And I, I've got you something that I am sure you do not have. This is 
This is something called laser-induced graphene. It was a process we developed in 2013 where a laser can hit any surface that's made out of carbon, and in this case, it's paper. And the laser can write a pattern. So what you're going to look at is paper that has been converted into carbon. The carbohydrates have been converted into graphene through the laser action. And so here's what we've got for you. Oh. That's very lovely. It's a nice gesture. Thank you. Is this on? Thank you. Thanks very much, James. So I have, uh, I have 10 minutes for an opening statement. Right. Mr. Farina, as my guest, welcome to Rice University. Unlike Mr. Farina, I have never been in a debate before. So if it appears that I am not a skilled debater, it's an accurate assessment. A major hurdle for the origin of life research is the origin and persistence of enantiopure molecules. The building blocks of the building blocks, as I call them. Enantiopurity means that one mirror image of a molecule prevails to the exclusion of the other. This includes 19 of the 20 amino acids, the monomeric sugars, the nucleotides, and the lipids. But for the sake of getting through, I am conceding tonight to my opponent all those small molecules in 100% enantiomeric purity. They are yours. I concede them to you for the sake of time. So let's address other issues tonight, since my concession has been granted and there's still much more ground to cover. I am here defining clueless. Oh, this, this has gone off. <laughs> All right. Hold the time a second for me while I log back in here. Okay, they, they, they had to have me use this one because of the way the feeds are working. So um, uh, when this logs back in. Okay, but I, I'll, I'll continue now in any case. I'm here defining clueless in the context of my typical usage. Uh, let me open up this document. <laughs> Got to do it. I mean, this is, this is, just, this is just life, you know? <laughs> I, I teach in this room, so I'm, I'm used to this. This just happens. Okay. So I'm defining clueless in the context of my typical usage. We cannot solve any of the five criteria needed to make a living cell. None of these can be solved. Mr. Freena has complained that I am a religious man. I'm not just religious, I'm deeply religious. Or as he puts it, I'm a, quote, super, super Jesus guy, unquote. <laughs> While that's a label that I gladly embrace, and I believe that the Bible is God's word, I never appeal to that book of authority in my academic lectures or scientific discussions. Never, unless specifically asked about my religious convictions, like in a church or a religious podcast, I never couple those to my scientific criticisms of the origin of life research. I will not appeal to the Bible, to God, to miracles, to Jesus, to God of the gaps tonight. Often, origin of life researchers have a time of the gaps appeal where they will say something to the effect, over millions of years, such and such happened. Those bedtime stories that are devoid of any precise chemistry may as well start with once upon a time. So I hope that my opponent will likewise not appeal to ill-defined time of the gaps arguments and that he'll stay strictly on the scientific data, the data. As for me, I will stick to the data. The topic tonight is not about me, it's whether there is a valid hypothesis to make a living cell on a mindless early earth. In discussing scientific data, it's not a matter of deception or lies. It is a matter of data interpretation. That happens all the time in science. It's hard to interpret the scientific literature data. And as I do with my graduate students, we learn from each other. They from me and I from them. I plan to address Mr. Freena as I would a graduate student seeking to learn from him tonight. The textbook definition for the characteristics of life is responsiveness to the environment, growth and change, ability to reproduce, having metabolism and breathe, maintaining homeostasis and being made of cells and passing traits onto offspring. 
A valid hypothesis is one in which there is experimental evidence substantiating the proposed science. An invalid hypothesis is one in which there is no way to substantiate the proposed science. For example, my guest arrived to Houston from Los Angeles. A valid hypothesis would be that he flew to Houston on a commercial aircraft. That is a valid hypothesis because we can experimentally test the efficacy of commercial air travel. An invalid hypothesis would be that he drove here in a single molecule nano car. Though that statement might be true, it is an invalid hypothesis since we have no experimental evidence for its validity. Nobody was present at life's origin, so we will never really know how life originated. But that's not what we are seeking to answer tonight. What we are seeking is an experimentally valid, verifiable hypothesis as to how life might have originated on an early Earth. We must see the origin of life research data, not their unsubstantiated claims, even if those claims are written in their research papers. Mr. Farina, please show us their data. Show their data. My contention remains the same. One day I presume that we will have a valid hypothesis upon which life might have originated. But as of today, we do not. And with each passing year, the cellular target that we must disclose becomes harder to reach due to the increased realization of its minimal complexity. A study in the Journal of Pragmatics in 2021 considered the trend of hyperbole in scientific publications. The authors, Highland and Jiang, wrote, quote, we trace the use of 400 hyping words which seek to promote, embellish, or exaggerate aspects of research papers. Our results show a massive increase in these items, and increases are most marked in the hard sciences." Unquote. So while overblown statements are occurring in all fields, origin of life takes the cake. My opponent's favorite expert, Professor Lee Cronin, said in 2011 that he'd probably create lab life in his lab in two years. He did not. Another, whom he often cites, Professor Jack Sostek, then at Harvard, now at the University of Chicago, said in 2014 that he'd create life in his lab in three to five years. He did not. Professor Dimitar Seselov from Harvard University said in 2014 that life would be created in the lab in five years. It did not happen, not even close. Prebiotically relevant means that we are restricted to materials, procedures, and conditions that might have been available on an early Earth. These are the five criteria. These are the five criteria that have to be experimentally addressed in, order, in a prebiotically relevant manner in order to have a valid hypothesis for life's origin. We only have time for five tonight. Polypeptides, polynucleotides, polysaccharides, the origin of specified information, and the assembly of the above components into an integrated functional living system, namely a cell not merely a random mixture of these. If my opponent is unable to supply all five criteria for life, then we're currently clueless on the origin of life. But since I don't think he'll be able to supply even one of the five, it will show that we're not merely clueless, but utterly clueless. While some would like to portray me as one of the very few people that does not accept the hyped claims of origin of life researchers, I maintain that overconfident supporters of origin of life, like my opponent, are being abandoned by the origin of life research community itself. For example, Mr. Farina's own experts, whom he likes to cite, are now backing away from their own overblown claims. His often cited origin of life expert, Professor Jack Sostek, now says that aside from nature's construct of RNA, invoking of, quote, autocatalytic sets was never chemically realistic, unquote. Hence, the prebiotic relevance of autocatalytic sets crumbles. It's over, according to Professor Sostek. His often cited origin of life expert, Professor Donna Blackman, now acknowledges that there are no known prebiotically relevant autocatalytic reactions that greatly enhance chirality of a substrate. The increases are minor. <clears throat> so, no need to waste our time tonight on autocatalysis. His own origin of life expert, Professor Stephen Benner, an enormous figure in this field, now says that any group of randomly synthesized RNA molecules would afford, quote, 10 million or 100 million more molecules that catalyze the destruction of RNA, unquote, than catalyze the copying of themselves, and quote, this will never give you life, unquote. <clears throat> Hence, the relevance of random RNA to make copies of itself bites the dust. It's over, according to Professor Benner himself. Origin of life expert, James, <clears throat> Professor James Shapiro now writes, certain questions like the origins of the first living cells currently have no 
credible scientific answers, unquote. Evolution <coughs> kingpin, Professor Richard Dawkins now says, quote, we know little more than Darwin did about how it got started in the first place. We have no evidence bearing upon the momentous event that was <coughs> the start of evolution on this planet, unquote. My opponent's favorite origin of life expert, Professor Lee Cronin, now writes and says on multiple occasions that, quote, origin of life research is a scam, unquote. And, quote, there are lots of layers to the scam, unquote. A scam means a dishonest scheme or a fraud. It's beautiful. It's as if Professor Lee Cronin has been scientifically born again. <laughs> Mr. Farina. I respect your courage to be here tonight. It's too bad that origin of life researchers are not here themselves to defend their own data. Maybe they know the shallowness of their own research, while the less informed cannot assess the shallowness. I'm looking forward to seeing the data with chemical specificity. That's what I will be asking of you, so I'm telling you up front. Not the overblown titles, not their outlandish claims, not the once upon a time over a million years stories but the data to propose a valid hypothesis to the five criteria needed to build a living cell, thereby overcoming our cluelessness on origin of life. Thank you. Mr. Farina, your opening statement, please. Straight up. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks to Rice University for having us here tonight. Uh, we are here because of James Tour. James is a chemist and also an apologist who lies about origin of life research on the internet. It's quite the double life. In order to understand why he does this, we turn to his faith. James has admitted publicly that he is a creationist. He believes that God created life due to religious scripture, which to him takes priority over scientific evidence. From his website, faith and belief go beyond scientific evidence for this scientist. Anyone who thinks this is not relevant to, this, to the discussion is delusional, as James is openly admitting that there's no science that could ever be done that will convince him that life was not directly created by God. He is ideologically bound to denying abiogenesis. He sometimes pretends to leave room for it, as he did just now, to seem open-minded, but he isn't. He's totally dogmatic. Therefore, his opinions on origin of life research are irrelevant, as he is approaching the field not as a scientist, but as a preacher. Of course, James pretends his rhetoric is scientific. He will bring up his H-index and list of publications. Less important is the fact that he has publicly admitted that his students do all the work and he slaps his name on the papers. Uh, more important is the fact that none of his research has anything to do with origin of life whatsoever and does not qualify him in this topic, which is not strictly synthetic organic chemistry as he claims, but also astronomy, geology, physics, and lots of other areas James is clueless about. When it comes to this topic, James is a YouTuber. His embarrassing commentary takes place exclusively on YouTube or in-person events for science illiterate Christians who share his biases and delusions. James knows that science is done through the primary scientific literature, and he knows that his inability to publish anything on this topic makes him completely irrelevant. That's why he regularly lies and pretends that he is published in this area, and his papers are ignored because of conspiracy. These papers are actually blog posts in Inference Review, launched by Discovery Institute propagandist David Berlinski, which is not peer-reviewed and exists for the sole purpose of making pseudoscience appear more legitimate. Jim's clueless ramblings do not even remotely resemble primary scientific literature, but he lists them among his actual science on his website anyway. Of course, when facing this topic, James somehow forgets what primary literature is supposed to look like. That's how he initially got into hot water, slandering Nobel laureate Jack Shostak. James was complaining about the prestigious journal Nature and what Shostak allegedly published in it and how it doesn't meet the typical standards of the journal. He called Jack a liar multiple times to the delight of his clueless cackling audience. In actuality, it wasn't primary literature at all, but a web article meant for lay people, and there were no lies or inaccuracies, as James continues to claim to this day. His profoundly unprofessional and defamatory behavior has only gotten worse as he now regularly attacks prominent researchers in this field or blatantly misquotes and misrepresents them. And that's why we're here, to highlight Jim's fraudulence. There is nothing to debate. The question as to whether we are clueless about the origin of life is idiotic. We aren't. Apologists like James train viewers to regurgitate the ridiculous lie that there has been no progress since the Miller-Urey experiment of the 1950s. In reality, we have multiple, multiple viable prebiotic synthetic pathways 
to all the relevant biomolecules and their polymers. And systems chemistry is showing us how sets of these molecules kind of evolved over millions of years to produce the first protocell, which we will discuss later. James knows essentially nothing about any of it, but pretends to for his viewers who take him on blind faith, something they are quite comfortable doing. So we will get to James fumbling the science in a moment, but first it is important to establish that James is a brazen liar and charlatan in ways that everyone can understand without knowing anything about science. For example, part of Jim's script is to complain about the primordial soup model. He describes this as lightning striking some water and molecules form a slithering creature that crawls out. Uh, this is the dumbest straw man in history. Yet he insists that all these textbooks say precisely this, and it is taught to undergraduates as well as graduate students. In actuality, the textbooks look like this. They contain summaries of much of the research we will discuss momentarily. Syntheses of biomolecules, ribozymes, autocatalysis, and other complex concepts. So he's just lying. He's trying to make science he doesn't like seem infantile and stupid. Another way he downplays the validity of the field is to pretend that almost no one is working in it. He claims it's a boutique field with no more than a dozen teams examining the problem. That's a lie. There are thousands of scientists working on this all over the world. He needs to lie about this because it's much more difficult to claim that thousands of scientists are all either corrupt or stupid while only James knows the truth. A dozen is much easier to swallow, so he lies. He also pretends to be well-read in the subject. He isn't. He has admitted that he's read less than 5% of the lit literature on the topic, although in reality, over 3 million papers have been published since 2016, so he's read maybe a thousandth of a percent of the literature. More importantly, for the few papers he has read, the diligence he projects is a facade. As to anyone knowledgeable, he reveals a level of incompetence that is shocking for someone of his stature. Take, for example, this study by Stephen Benner, a researcher James regularly slanders. Here, Benner was showing nucleotide polymerization over basaltic glass to form RNA. James notes that Benner washes the glass thoroughly with hydrogen peroxide and ultra-pure water, and then throws his hands in the air about how this makes the study not prebiotically relevant, because he is washing away trace magnesium that would impede nucleotide polymerization on the early Earth. In his profound ignorance, James neglects to realize that basaltic rock is specifically rich in magnesium, information that anyone who had taken Geology 101 would know. Furthermore, he wonders where or oh, where could one find hydrogen peroxide and ultra-pure water on the early Earth, as though its use makes the study not prebiotically relevant. In reality, these are used to destroy biological material like bacteria that would contaminate the results. So, in fact, the washes are done specifically to make the experiment prebioti prebiotically relevant. This example is crucial because James will focus much of his empty criticism on claiming that research is not sufficiently prebiotic. But remember this example where James was so clueless that he does not even understand what the researchers are doing and why. This is his primary tactic. He skims the supplemental section of a paper, invents a technical flaw out of thin air, and pretends it negates the results of the paper, and by extension, origin of life research in general. But it gets much worse. James regularly botches concepts not just in geology, but also in his own field. For an example, we return to Benner's research where he synthesized ribose in prebiotically relevant fashion. James doesn't like it one bit, and when confronted with a 13 CNMR spectrum demonstrating the presence of ribose, uh, he not only pretends the data is invalid, but he goes to town with meme after meme, cartoon after cartoon, childishly mocking Benner for his garbage data. Here's his laughing Spanish guy meme where the whole crowd laughs in unison at the idiot Benner who thinks he got ribose when it's actually a mess of a billion compounds. But the joke is on James as his pathetic commentary reveals that he can't even read a 13C NMR spectrum, something he should have learned as an undergrad. James compares the spectrum to that of pure ribose when the sample is ribose borate, a different compound, with broad peaks due to rapidly interconverting forms. The billions of compounds are actually just noise as the vertical axis is expanded to highlight the wider peaks. This abject failure has been confirmed by every chemist I've corresponded with, from Benner himself to J. William Suggs, professor emeritus of chemistry at Brown University and many others. The idea that James can't do something that an undergrad could do is astounding, and whether his brain ceases to function when examining this research, or he is deliberately lying to a gullible audience with no clue what he's talking about, his credibility is reduced to zero with this example alone. 
<clears throat> so that's a brief summary of James Tour. He's a toxic individual and pathological liar who actively promotes science denial and slanders diligent researchers. Or in my case, he scours the internet for clips of me in music videos to commit character assassinations or unleashes a barrage of insults about how Dave doesn't know chemistry, even though most of his students use my organic chemistry tutorials to get through his unbearable course. <laughs> he baselessly shouts hype when his own research is full of hype. He whines about being accused of believing in the God of the gaps when he objectively does. He publicly calls for the halting of an entire field of science he doesn't understand just to shelter his fragile, archaic faith. But today, finally, with no desk to hide behind, every tactic will be elucidated in real time, and he will be made accountable for his lies for everyone to see. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I will. We now turn to uh, Dr. Tour, who uh, will ask a question. One of the things that we have to make in order to have life are polypeptides, where we take amino acids and these amino acids have to couple. And when they couple, it will form a dipeptide. <clears throat> this dipeptide is one of thousands and thousands and thousands that would have to form. If you were going to make a polypeptide, you'd need at least 100 of these for a very small polypeptide. <clears throat> Mr. Farina, show me the prebiotic chemistry that would do this coupling. Be my guest. OK. Uh, yeah, I don't need the board. I... So this was my second prompt. So I guess we'll circle back to this. But um, yeah, you keep. Go and show me the references in your uh, in your in your content, but um, so you're missing a mountain of research, uh, literally a mountain of research that demonstrates this. So uh, here's one: condensation of amino acids to form peptides in aqueous solution. So we've got sulfur four oxidative model, uh, carbonyl sulfide mediated pep prebi uh, mediated prebiotic formation of peptides. There's another one. Uh, this that one does not do it, and the two you showed do not do it. This is called asparagine D. K. They do not do it with these. Okay, so what is the, Lehman's a fraud? Gadiri's a fraud? Are you ca calling them oh, fraud? They look, published look. a paper, carbonyl sulfide mediated prebiotic formation of peptides. So if you're saying they didn't do that, you're Show me the example in there. I studied this. I looked over every paper you, you put up. You have never studied anything in this area. Are you kidding me? All you do is go, show me the papers, and then I show you papers. Here, let's see if I can find that one exactly. Yeah, sh show me the one exactly that does this in a prebiotic fashion. Show me. It's not there. Okay. I'm asking you to come up and show me the chemistry. James, you keep I don't need to write papers. on the board. I brought actual papers. This is actual research. Okay, show me the papers. Show there me you go. in that paper this example. Okay. This is called. Okay. This, this is, is the one you wanted. Aspartic James. acid. James. This is called lysine. James, look. This is the Gadiri paper. Here's the scheme. You want to you go through that? that? But aqueous, aqueous room temperature, you get oligopeptides. Okay, and it jumps to 80% yield with prebiotic oxidizing agents. But like not, not with this, it. because what happens is this would participate, this oh, would participate. Oh, you want to do the side chain thing. Okay, well, we've got research for that, too. The, the, of course, I'm speaking to the side chain. This is not glycine. There you go. Uh, That's not prebiotically relevant. What that has not nothing to do with relevant. prebiotic. Okay, that how about this one? That sulfur compound was made separately in dichloromethane using HOBT, which is a coupling agent designed by human beings for solid phase synthesis. There, That's how they made the bio. Are you saying bio. sulfur is not available prebiotically? It doesn't matter what solvent H, they use. No, HOBT was, was the, the compound, that SH compound that you just showed was made in a separate reaction. That was in, in a separate reaction, and he describes that. Okay. I can show you in the paper. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you don't like that one, how about this Pounder one? Uh, Pounder, Jax, Regioselective Peptide Formation. Acylated amino nitrile. Uh, right. Wait, hold on. I got the scheme here. It's not in there. You're going to look and look. It's not in there. I studied every one of your papers. Mm -hmm. Pounder doesn't even use uh, uh, amino acids. He uses an amino... Amino nitrile. Amino, that's a, amino nitrile. That's a totally that is different not paper. Amino acid. James, that's not the same paper. You're no, talking about a different there paper. There is no coupling. Look, he got coupling with lysine, regioselective lysine ligation, the most selective peptide ligation that tolerates all proteinogenic side chains. But he did he this does not with do all side an chains. amino acid coupling. He's got. What are you talking Z about? Prebiotic catalytic peptide ligation. There's no amino acids there. He's yes, it's amino acids. Okay, so what go, are you go talking to the about? equation of well, that. Go to the equation of that. I don't have that one, but you're just lying. You're also no, I'm shifting not lying. the goalposts, though. I'll show you though, the paper. Because, by the way, you, you pretend that there are no papers, that there are no papers that show any peptide formation in water. I just showed you a ton. You're shifting but goalposts by complaining about the side chains. How am I shifting the goalposts? These are the Be ones you've got to do. If you can, 